Hello, and welcome to Arts and Entertainment. With Chris and Randall. I'm Chris. I'm Randall. And today we have a special guest joining us. This is, uh, yeah, today joining us is my brother, uh, Nick, Nick Gentila. And the reason my brother- Welcome, Nick. The reason my Hi, guys. Hi, Nick. The reason my brother is here is because uh, we're Don't say. It's a mystery. (laughs) These are mystery guests, Randall. But there's clues. There's clues. Well, only to the people who can see us. To those of you listening, you're going, what's going on? So before we start the show, I always like to say, hey, if you enjoy watching our show or listening to our show, please like, subscribe, and share. Every Thursday at 3 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, we put out a new edition on all podcast formats. Uh, If you have any ideas, suggestions, comments, Randall, what's the best way to reach us? Uh, Well, check out our website, chrisandrandall.com. There's a bunch of ways to reach us there. Uh, We're pretty popular on Facebook. You can uh, send us a message on there. Also, yeah, we'd love to know, especially today's episode, what you thought, uh, if you have, how your feelings are, did we explain things in a way that makes sense? So I'm going to start today's story, or today's show, sorry, with a brief little story. Uh, so back in early October of last year, uh, a guy named Michael Winkleman, who lives in South Carolina, he's a 39-year-old digital artist, and he goes by the name Beeple. And he noticed increasing talk on online circles about a technology called NFT which stands for non-fungible tokens, and how NFTs are a tool for providing proof of ownership for digital asset. Anyway, um, he is making artwork on um, Instagram, and these artworks, he calls them every day. And, you know, how would I describe them? You know, if you know Banksy or Jeff Koons or uh, Keith Haring, it's that kind of, or silly or Banksy iconic art that is somewhat illustrative, somewhat satirical. Uh, He has 2 million followers on Instagram. So on October 30th, Winkleman, AKA Beepsy, launched his first drop of three artworks on the NFT marketplace, Nifty Gateway, to test his saleability. One piece is called Politics is Bullshit. Uh, The work comes in an edition of 100 at a cost of $1 for each edition. A core feature of the blockchain technology is immutability, which is what this is on. It's on a blockchain. All transactions are recorded and are permanent and transparent, which means that any NFT purchase or sale is visible to the public. So as of last month, the edition has resold for as much as $600,000. Uh, this past December, uh, Beepsy put together another drop, which included what he calls the Complete MF Collection, which is a selection of everyday's images such as a skinless corp uh, and a giant Nintendo characters and a single NFT, which came with the physical accessories, including a digital picture frame as further evidence of authenticity and a purported sample of, of the artist's hair, people's hair. The winning bid for this work of NFT art was $777,700. It was just, Randall, help me here. uh, $700,700. It's hard to say, isn't it? I don't know. It's it's around seven hundred thousand and seventy thousand and seven thousand more. Add that together. It's six sevens, <laughs> unless it was a seventy cents. We're having a hard time with the math. They wanted uh, to do the guy wanted to bid all sevens, all sevens. So all under eight hundred thousand dollars, folks. Uh, and then last month, a mosaic of pieces. These are his everydays that he put together over thirteen years, called Everydays. The first five thousand days was auctioned off at the famous Christie's auction house as an NFT. Uh, The opening bid began at $100 uh, with an estimated selling price of unknown. On March 11, the piece, this NFT art called Every Day is the First 5,000 Days, sold for $69,000. 
million dollars. Isn't that amazing, Randall? It's a lot of money. Do you know, Randall, that this makes uh, Winkleman the third most expensive? So he is the. There are only two other artists alive today who have actually made more money on a single work of art. Uh, Jeff Koons for Rabbit and David Hockney for Portrait of an Artist, Pool with Two Picture Figures. Uh, And those two sold roughly around $90 million. So here's a guy who four months ago was making no money, and now he's the third highest paid living artist. Damien Hirst, who is one of the highest paid living artists, albeit not in the top three, he's like in the top seven. He uh, reached out to uh, Winkleman on his iPhone. He said, my 15-year-old son showed me your work a while ago. This is fucking great. Congratulations, you're awesome. So yes, so Beepsy is now recognized by artists as an artist. And of course, art critics are up in arms because how can this happen? So I'm a 55-year-old guy. I do know a lot about painting, but I know nothing about NFT. In fact, I'll be honest with you, until March 11th, when this piece of work sold, I didn't even know such a thing existed. Randall, did you know much about this world prior to the show? No, I didn't know much about it. I didn't uh, know. And it's weird because I rely on Randall <laughs> to basically do all the tech stuff. You know, like when, when we do stuff that's hip and cutting edge, that's a Randall thing. And I thought, you know, if only we had someone who was like Randall, but just younger and smarter. <laughs> and then... Of course, I realize, Randall, you always have a spare, a smarter, younger version of you. Yeah, that's is, why this Nick is, is here. It's, it's my brother, Nick. And the reason he's on the show is because Nick has been working in the cryptocurrency space for many years. And uh, you're a computer programmer, right, Nick? Yep, that's right. I've been uh, working in cryptocurrency for, since probably 2015, 2014, around there. Oh, my God. You, were, you came in really at the beginning. It was early. Yeah, it was early. I mean, I knew about it before then, but I wasn't actually, you know, I knew about Bitcoin when it, you know, it was pennies or whatever, but I was I was still, you know, at that point, I was still, this is a silly, you know, I, I wasn't actually into it. Uh, it. It wasn't until about 2014, 2015 when I actually got into it. But by that time, Bitcoin was worth about $210 or something. What, what is Bitcoin worth now? Sixty thousand dollars. Oh my lord! Down. Oh my lord! I, so, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna ask Nick. I'm gonna ask you the questions that only a a guy my age who knows nothing. I don't even know how to operate my microwave. Okay, I I still. I'm gonna ask you stupid people questions, and then Randall will ask you smart people questions, and hopefully, eventually, we'll get around to. So, I'm gonna ask you the simple questions first, which is, what is an NFT? All right. An NFT is an ownership record, basically. It's an ID that's saved into a public database, which is the blockchain. You can think of the blockchain as a public database, and everybody has the same copy of that database. And then uh, an NFT is an ID on that database that saves their, like, say it's ID 1,422,000. And then that ID has one owner. And then that owner um, is an Ethereum address. So the person What's who bought- What's Ethereum? I have to, um, sorry. Okay, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, actually, it doesn't have to be Ethereum. But uh, let me explain. So Ethereum is a blockchain. Like Bitcoin is one blockchain. And then Ethereum right. is another blockchain. And um, the reason why we have two different blockchains and why everybody doesn't just use Bitcoin is because um, Ethereum, it has more features than Bitcoin. So uh, you can't really do NFTs the way that NFTs are done um, currently with all these NFT markets and the Beeple sale and stuff like that. You can't really do them on Bitcoin. Hey, so Nick, uh, isn't an NFT a feature they built into Ethereum, the Ethereum blockchain from the start? I think I read that. Um, So it was always capable of doing this. Um, Ethereum was always capable of, of doing this sort of thing. Um, but it wasn't until about the end of 2017 when um, CryptoKitties was launched 
that there was an official standard of how to do this. And then everybody sort of agreed on the way that this should be done. Was uh, was crypto? What is crypto? Kitty? Sorry, go ahead. I just want to ask, did CryptoKitties help invent the standard or did the standard come about or did they invent the standard and then CryptoKitties took advantage of it? Well, they did actually totally and they dictated the standard. Crypto they, what is CryptoKitties? Crypto I, I got to okay, Yeah, ask. Nick, go for it. Explain to, explain to Chris and people that don't know what CryptoKitties is because that's CryptoKitties is the reason NFTs exist is what you're saying. Right. They are. I mean, they, they would have come to be, come to exist, but not in this, the format they are today. They would have. There was pressure to make NFTs or something like this, but um, crypt, the company uh, behind CryptoKitties, uh, uh, um, is it Dapper Lab? I can't remember. Like, so they they stepped in and said, um, "This is going to be the standard." Um, they proposed it to the community. The community weighed in and said, "That looks good." Um, and then they and then they started using that standard first because um, they they created the first product for it, and so they created a game called crypto kitties and the, the idea of the game was that you buy these tokens um with ethereum which is uh which is the money for the ethereum blockchain um you buy these these token ids um when you buy one it just means that that token id now um is only unlockable by your your ethereum address so you're the only one who can transfer it to the next person so it's like this big game of like who's of hot potato and the person who has that that ID who owns that ID is the only one who can unlock it and transfer it to the next guy. Would you um, say oh, that is uh, that's what you mean by the, the token? The token is the potato is the is the crypto kitty. It's like who, whoever whoever's whoever's address is assigned as the owner for that ID is the only person who can change who the owner is. And then, so then the next person becomes the next person who can assign it and change it. So Nick, so Nick. this is kind of, I'm sorry, I just want to finish my thought. Uh, so in the world of art, there's in the world of painting, for example, uh, there's a thing called Provence, Provence. I can never yeah. say that word correctly. And it's, uh, it's the legal authentication that this work is the real work of art. And it normally lists all the people who have owned the artwork so that you can kind of see since it came from the artist, who are the other people who've owned it? So right. Is it kind of like that? Yeah. So because of the, so there's this whole chain of ownership that goes back to the original, to the person who originally uh, minted. They said that's the term for it is the person who, who, who created the information about this ID on the blockchain in the first place. And so that the first owner of these IDs is considered the creator. And um, so in the case of like Beeple, for instance, um, the first owner is the artist Beeple. And it can be traced back to a, to a, an address that is, is, is owned by Beeple. In some cases, it's owned by a publishing company. It's not actually owned by the, the artist Beeple himself. And when you but, say publishing company, you mean the company that made the token? Right, the company that made the token, which in that case is Maker's Place, I so, believe. So just to clarify, the blockchain uh, uh, is a record of ownership forever of the token. Right, it's so that— public. It's completely public, and it's decentralized. No one owns it. Yeah, no one owns it, and so that's what's so special about this is that— so if you were to—if someone were to steal a piece of art, um, you know, from uh, from a museum, uh, from, from the Louvre, and, uh, and and now they have it, they would have it in their possession. And that's possible. Somebody can steal a piece of art. Um, if somebody were to come into your house and steal your baseball card collection, that's a possibility. Right now, it's mathematically impossible for someone to steal uh, the Beeple painting, uh, the Beeple NFT. And that's because Sorry. crypto cryptocurrency, uh, the blockchain is based on uh, an impossible to break code. Right. Is that that's a good where, way of describing it? Yeah, absolutely. That's the that's where all the value comes from, really, is in that mathematical um, sort of impossibility to to break this encryption. So, in other words, like for those of you who are just listening as opposed to watching, right now in the background uh, is NFT art, and all I did was I went online and I copied it, and. <laughs> Anybody can copy or reproduce this work, but the 
And, and I, I was able to find out that the artist does own the copyright, correct? It's yes, actually, yes, that's illegal. So what's actually so what is actually being owned by owning the token is is I guess somewhat similar to just owning the Provence. It's Providence? it's it's uh, you're owning an ID that was owned by the artist uh, or who is owned by a publishing company that the artist um, approved of, and. So everybody uh, recognizes the provenance of that token. And um, the, the picture itself is just a pretty uh, image that's placed on top of that token ID. Now, the yeah. picture itself is available to anyone. Is that correct? Um, the art itself? Yeah. The art, anybody could, can look at that art at any time. There's no limitation to who can see that art. At yeah, I, I guess I want to interject for a minute here, Chris. Uh, uh, Chris has more questions, but um, I think it. this is one of the things that really uh, sets apart this idea of uh, NFT art, crypto art, uh, sets it apart from like a traditional art. Because if you bought a piece of art <laughs> and you put it in your bedroom, <laughs> no one could ever see it. But these people are buying NFT art and everybody can see it forever, which is, yeah. is quite different. Literally, the only right that the blockchain guarantees the owner, there's only one right that, or privilege that the owner of an NFT has, and, and it's one right and one right only, um, and that is to transfer the ownership to somebody else. That's so fascinating because, you know, if you think about it, and, and I guess it's the very nature of digital art, which just, uh, you're more of an expert on this. How would you describe what is digital art in the most technical sense of the word? Art that is created through software, is that the how you describe it? Well, right now, um, these NFTs, some of, the, some of them are just high quality photos of original, you know, of paintings and like a physical like art. Like that Mona Lisa right behind you with the pixelated face. Code. Yeah, well, that one was somebody pixelated it, so they, they yeah, turned it into something beeple. new. That's a people, Chris. <laughs> and that, yeah. So uh, my point is this, is that, you know, Video art and has been around since the late 60s. Even cinema, you know, just people, Dolly would experiment with film. So there has been projection, there has been film and TV and video in contemporary art for quite a long time now. But that's still different, isn't it? I mean, in, in that, um, it's not the same thing as saying a videotape or a, a film. It's well, yeah. I think the thing about this art is not the art itself. So it's not this. What's special about these NFTs is not the art. It's not the pictures. It's not uh, th those are side effects. What's special about this the, these NFTs is is the technology and the process. So um, what you're buying is like a pe like a sentiment from the artist. You're buying like like um, you're supporting the artist in a way. You're 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 buying like the artist has agreed to issue ten tokens that come from that artist. It's like um, the the artist is opening their heart to you and saying these are ten um, pieces of me, and um, there it's token IDs one through fifty two. And this is what those token IDs mean to me. And if you support me, then buy one of these tokens. Um, and that's kind of, and, and because of what these, how the technology works for this, um, they can actually sell those and the, the money goes straight to the artists. And um, yeah, yeah. some of these websites like Nifty Gateway, I know uh, every single sale of that token in perpetuity, some percent goes to the artist. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's up to the marketplace to implement. Um, some you can implement it or not on OpenSea. You can have a royalty um, uh, for your collection that goes on forever. Um, and Nifty, it's implemented different ways on different uh, well, platforms. That's a good. Let me ask you that question because I guess my first question is, uh, well, actually, before I get to that question, I think this is a good time to say. Explain how your business that you work in fits into this equation. What is it that you guys do at your company? Sure. So um, 
So my company, um, I mean, this is really fitting. We happen to be talking about this because I, 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 my company is the number one NFT app in the app store right now. Actually, both app stores. Um, and it What's just, it called again so people can know when they go to the app store? Yeah, it's called OwnerFi, um, like owner, the word, and then F-Y. Um, and you can type in OwnerFi. W- I'm so bad with this. Do you want to spell yeah, I'll it put out? Put it in the description. O W N E R F Y. Owner. Owner. Fi. Okay. Okay. Continue. Um, so yeah, just, just you know, typing that into the App Store. Um, but you could actually just type in NFT to the App Store, and uh, Owner Fi is the first result. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it's a pretty incredible situation to be in because um, I couldn't beg people to use my app like two years ago. And now, like, the world has gone crazy can, over this. Can I use your app to create NFT art? Yeah, so that's what most people are using it for right now. Um, and um, everybody is sort of just uploading their art. And I think it's amazing. It's, like, it's probably the easiest way. Um, m- you know, my vision was always to make it easy for anybody to use this technology. And, um, and so that's why, that's why I did it on a, as a phone app. And instead of like most of these companies are having you do the NFTs from their website and it's much more complicated. So, so let me just ask, uh, if I wanted to create a piece of NFT art and sell it, I would have to use your app to create to uh, a token for my piece of art. And then, uh, I would, after that's done, I would have to go to somewhere like nifty gateway or another website that has a marketplace and then sell the token on that marketplace. Is that correct? Yeah, and there's a couple of reasons we did it that way. Um, the main reason is because it's a lot of work making a marketplace, and um, you people just want to sell on whatever the biggest marketplace is. So, Nick, uh, OwnerFi, your OwnerFi app, it's the most popular app for making NFT art right now. Is that correct? Yeah. So it's it's like it's as if we were the if you just type in NFT, it is the number one result that comes up in both app stores. So it's like it's like if you were the number one NFT result in Google, it's it's like a really crazy thing to be right now. But you have competition. I don't have to use your app to make NFT art, although your app is easy to use. Um, But uh, you think the reason it's so popular is, is it's by far the cheapest way to do it, right? Well, actually, we don't have competition in the app store. We are literally the only app in both stores that you, you can, can make to, NFTs with. But you, but you but can make. If you're the only app in the store, then what yeah. is this an infomercial for? You might as well. That damn it! This is going to be an infomercial. Now you're the only guy in town. Okay, but no, continue on. But 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 most people don't make make NFTs through their phone, so that's why it's not like. It's it's a weird thing to do. Most people just make them on the website on websites. So I'd rather do we, everything on the phone. <laughs> My girlfriend teaches online. She has people take tests on the phone. Who, who sits in front of a computer anymore? Okay, I'm yeah, sorry. I go ahead. I don't even want to stop. Like, get out of TikTok. I want to do everything while I'm still in TikTok. I'm, I'm recording right here with you on my iPhone. <laughs> hey Nick, uh, how many how many NFT artworks do you think are made on your app a day? Right now, it's like um, eight, between like around eight. Um, it's not that many because, because there's just not that many people, but, but they, they're expensive. So it's impressive that anybody's making NFTs on how much? How, how much would you say it is per like a dollar amount to make one? I mean, you need a theory so, to do it, but. Uh, yeah, it's like $45 for one. But I mean, so it's like, it's like $70 on OpenSea and then another $100 if you want to sell. So it's so 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 on my app, I'm charging like like basically cost. I'm just like just just people are just paying for the gas fees because I just want people to use it. So like so I don't I'm not, have to pay a fee for selling it on yours. No, you don't. So so once you transfer, once you import your your private key onto OpenSea or on the other um, on Rarible or whatever, you do have to like authorize them to sell it. So there's like a ten there's a ten dollar fee to authorize them but then um then there's no more fees after that to to sell and but but if you were to make it on OpenSea, you would spend um a hundred dollars to be able to sell in the first place wow. and then once somebody bought it from you you have to pay seventy dollars so if i use your app to to make an nft artwork uh do you 
think uh, I'm looking at getting it to make it on your app and getting it to marketplace? Do you think I'm looking at about what fifty bucks total? I, I would say sixty dollars conservative. You'll have some left over, but you know, if you just buy sixty dollars worth of Ethereum and then you have enough to do everything. All right. So I could make a work of art tonight and have it up on that world of NFT with the next day. Um. Yeah, you could make it to not. You could make it and have it up. You could make it um, have it up in a few minutes. It'll take like twenty minutes to, or like, it'll take like eight minutes to get, like to get created, and then it's already it's already exists on those marketplaces. You can already see the URL that goes to those marketplaces right after it gets created. You can go to those marketplaces and see it already. Now you just have to sell it. Yeah. You know, this is something I wanted to say, Chris, uh, for a little bit a while in this discussion is that. Um, one of the advantages I see of NFT art uh, and doing art this way is just the uh, the speed and the ease. I mean, if you're okay, so if you're if you're going the traditional route, you have to develop relationships with gallery owners. You're an artist. You have to develop relationships with gallery owners. You have to convince them to take you on as a as a client. You know, you got to convince them to sell your work, and then you have to do shows. You got to get your work sold and. And then you have to do what the gallery owner says because the gallery owner doesn't like what you're doing. You got to change your art. Um, with this NFT art, you just like tonight, <laughs> you get like 60 bucks of Ethereum, right? And you uh, uh, stick it on the uh, the marketplace or you, or you tokenize your art. And then it's going to be on the marketplace in a matter of hours and it's ready to sell. And people are looking at and it. And the cool thing is, even though people are, I assume, paying for this in Bitcoin, right? They're buying your art. With Bitcoin, or Ethereum, blockchain. Ethereum. Same, sorry, yeah. You're buying it. You can convert that back into dollars. Right. Yeah. So it's only like another step. There's another, you know, step to go back to Coinbase and then turn it into dollars and deposit in your bank account. Because I know that's what uh, Mr. Beepsy did. Beepsy Winkleman. Uh, he converted his fifty-five million dollar cut into fifty-five million dollars. Of U.S. dollars. Yeah, if I if I remember right, Beeple was paid with Ethereum. I think he was, but he converted it right into bucks. I read the article. You go, oh yeah, man, I'm right. I'm not keeping it in crypto, because uh, <laughs> you know I'm an old man. He's uh, not a crypto enthusiast. Nick, do you have any tips for people who want to? Now I really feel like a shell, but I'm I'm serious. Do you have any tips or advice for anybody who wants to get started or make money selling their artwork? in this world of nfts well i think it's really important to make to to make to put a little bit of effort into the nft so um so you have to you have to establish yourself you should make a series don't just make one make a series um have them all be related um so uh you know like most of the big most of the big like uh nfts that have been sold are part of series is a series and uh, so, so that they're recognizable, make them all in the same similar style. Then you can release like a series of these, a series of these, and then um, and then uh, I put a little bit of effort, you know, into them. May maybe like use a three D rendering thing or do them um, in it, in a di some digital software that um, looks kind of new or you know um, interesting in some like computer digital way, like um, or or, or just take pictures of your own art that you already create and that, you you know, if you're a sculptor, you take pictures of your own work that you sculpt. And if you're a painter, you take pictures of your paintings that you paint and, um, you know, be consistent and um, and then then advertise your own work because you're the only one who's going to uh, advertise it for you. So you have to post on your own social media and um, and, and be your own um, hype person. And then, um, and then try and publish it from the same platform all the time. Um, so, you know, whether it's mine or somebody else's, like, um, you know, you want to, you want to publish from the same address. So it's like always coming from the same address so that people can see that's that your, your address. Um, and, um, and that's, I mean, you know, I think that works, that works pretty well. Let, let's, let's just hypothetically say, uh, I do take photos and I like to, I have Instagram account and I like to, you know, I like to play with the colors and the shapes so that they're not just actual photos, but you know, they're, 
I have my own imprint. So, and sometimes I like to draw on like the paint programs on my iPad. So, yeah. okay, I've worked in that medium. So then how would I, what would be the next step to make it into NFT art? So if you're doing it from your iPad, that's really convenient because you can install the OwnerFi app on your iPad. Okay. Um, so then your next big hurdle is that you need to get some Ethereum. And that's, that's probably the hardest part of this whole process. So how do I get Ethereum? So um, the easiest way to get Ethereum is to, is to sign up at Coinbase and then you can just buy it with your credit card. Okay. And then is it a certain amount of Ethereum for each of the NFT arts that you create? Yeah. So um, to make one NFT, like it, it changes day to day because of the gas prices of Ethereum and how much Ethereum costs converted to dollars. Oh, like so, it's like gas in a car. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. They, you Technically, they call it gas. It's the amount of Ethereum you need to pay in order to like get this transaction to happen on the blockchain um, to mint this token. And it, it's about 0 0.02 or a little bit less than that 0 0.015 Ethereum or something like that. Um, which translates to about $37, I think, right now. Um, so my one, so I got my, like, I have my one work of art I made on my iPad. I pay about 40 bucks in Ethereum. And then do I go to your company at that point? So so then once you bought it at Coinbase.com, you would hit the transfer button. It's in the top right corner. And then you have to send that Ethereum to my app, Um uh, to your, to ownerfy to your account the uh, ownerfy gives you an ownerfy ethereum address that is your ethereum address in ownerfy and so then you would um, send the ethereum from coinbase to ownerfy's your your address in ownerfy there's a receive screen um, and then once that transaction happens you see you can follow it from coinbase coinbase usually takes a while it's probably like 15 minutes um, and then It'll show up in the owner file um, in the item screen. It'll sh your balance will show the amount of Ethereum you have. And then you spend it and, then, and make a token. And you make a token. So then there's a big plus button in the app. You hit the plus button, and then that starts the NFT making process. And it just you just it's just a step by step process. It's just a, a form that has the image at the top and the name and the description and um, and the quantity if you want to have a quantity. You can have a quantity. Yeah. So, oh yeah. So some of some of these NFTs are are have multiple quantity of the same NFT. So they'll have ten, basically ten of one. Um, and, it's like a limited edition print. If <laughs> you right, our discussions about uh, fine art photography. Exactly, and it's really good. It's really useful for things like token drops, where you want to give a thousand people uh, a copy each. Um, now, Nick, I want to I want to yeah. uh, ask you a couple more questions about this. Um, I know that uh, uh, you've been you've told me about token technology within the token itself. You can't put that much information, right? I mean, you can't put like the full artwork within the token, most likely. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, so most of these tokens they store their data completely off the blockchain, and um, there's almost no identifiable information about what that token is at all on the blockchain. So if you own token 121, um, then there's just like, usually there's just a URL that says, if you want to find out more about token 121, follow this URL and, and then you can get all the information. So it's up to the creator of the token as to where the actual work will be. Uh, and I know that Beeple well, used uh, the interplanetary file system, right? Can you explain what that is to uh, us, the interplanetary file system? Yeah, so the interplanetary file system is like a global file sharing um, uh, network that allows people to share uh, files based on their their uh, hash. So uh, hash is a digital fingerprint that you take of a file. So if you do two, uh, if you upload two images that are exactly the same, from two different computers on Earth, and you're both using IPFS, they will actually have the same URL um, because they have the same data, and um, that's sort of the magic of IPFS. 
Yeah, the IPFS network is decentralized, right? It's uh, it's similar to torrents. It's decentralized. Uh, so the idea is that it will. Uh, it's not dependent on any server, correct, Nick? So that's well, why that's the it's problem. Attractive. It it to... is dependent on on somebody keeping those files alive. So if right, but it is it, decentralized. It's decentral. It's decentralized in that anybody can start an IPFS server. Um, and anybody can start serving IPFS files. Uh, but if you upload some content to IPFS and, and uh, you, you go offline, your content goes offline. Right. Okay. But most, so most that people, is why there are. A, well, there's just ahead, one Rick. thing. Okay. I just, there's one other thing I wanted to say to Nick. Um, well, anyway, the, uh, the, uh, so most artists with their token, they'll probably link to their website. Probably, you would think, Nick, right? So he, that's where the producers, that's where the uh, the producers, the, the third party um, NFT producers come into play. Um, like my company, OwnerFi, like uh, OpenSea. Do, do you host uh, the content that the token might link to? Is that right? So we host the content, so you don't have to. You just okay. enter in the data. Okay. There's one other so thing. So I was. No it's just one other um, thing I wanted to... Uh, before you switch, can I just ask him one question? Yeah, go ahead. Because while we're on this topic... So, I okay, guess, Randall, you're so much smarter than me on this. <laughs> so I'm a little confused. Like, I, I have a website, and it has a URL, and, you know, you, you type it in, and you go to chrisandrandall.com. So what's the <laughs> difference between, like, HTTP, whatever, URL, and the URL that you guys are talking about? So, yeah, so the IPFS is, it's like, um, um, it's, it's facilitates multiple sh computers sharing the same file. So if, uh, so, so you could pay somebody to host your IPFS content um, on, it, on the other side of the planet. And um, they, they don't need to, they don't need to have a different URL as long as they're hosting the same content um, and it's exact copy of that content, then that content will stay online. So it's, it, it's sort of like a simplified, ver it, it's, it's a way to keep the same content online all the time. And then you, you can verify that it's the exact same content and, um, and you can. So it's much um, more reliable than like if I had a website just on, you know, a, a, a host gator or something. Yeah, well, if the if the URL exists, uh, if it, if the content comes from the from that 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 link, then it, you know it's the same content that it always was, because the link defines the content. So, ah, so it's the realm of authenticity. There is a there is an element of authenticity there, and also an element of of um, of share sharing the load too, because because you because anybody can can host these files, and then when you you get them from IPFS, um, like the network will handle where they come from. So if you've got like a hundred different servers that have that content on there, then the network should be able to efficiently get that content from them. So there's authenticity and there is, um, and there is uh, efficiency of uh, serving the content. Okay. So Nick, uh, just one little thing. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of people using owner five for NFT art now, right? Yeah. And I remember you telling me back in the olden days when you were, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, when you were trying to get these, uh, your apps in these app stores, you had a lot of problems, right? Because Yeah. That, what was the problem? They, they didn't like your app because uh, it, it had something to do with crypto? Um, well, let, let me just add one real quick like thing about OwnerFi, which is kind of cool about this, what we were just talking about with the hashes is that uh, OwnerFi, the way I designed the smart contract for OwnerFi, it actually saves a hash of the image, not the URL, but the image on the blockchain. So you can prove what image was supposed to belong to that NFT. Oh, I see. Um, so your app saves the image, your your server saves the image, but you, the but unique you also fingerprint make a of the image. What? Yeah, yeah, we also make a hash and put that on the blockchain. We also make a hash and stick it on the token, stick it in the token. Right, exactly, when it gets created. Right. That way, that way, like with IPFS, you're you're guaranteeing if you still have if you can fetch that data, you can guarantee you can show that that string data, like the metadata about that is the same. But with OwnerFi, you can you can prove that that that's actual a, image was the same. That's a great idea. Did you did you come up with that yourself? 
Yeah, I, I did come up with that. So you're the genius <laughs> that came up with that? <laughs> it's real smart. Um, so, so, so tell me about the struggle ahead. you had putting it on, on, on the, uh, so, these app stores. So, um, yeah, they have been a, a, a difficult uh, – Apple is so difficult when it comes to cryptocurrency. Anything that's blockchain or cryptocurrency, they make you jump through a million hoops, and they, they, they are uh, very strict. And it has been um, – you know, it's, I get 50% of my app updates approved by Apple. Wow. Um, well, yeah. it's because it's because there what for a few years there was a lot of cryptocurrency scamming going on, but your app was completely approved. You finally got it on. Your app is is totally legit. And yeah, but it has it nothing to do. It is it is like a very straightforward uh, you know, uh, uh service for people. Um and it has nothing to do with like crypto mining or like crypto pyramid schemes and all that stuff that gave crypto a bad name. And this kind of thing, like NFTs, is like a very practical, um, I dare to say, wholesome uh, form of this technology. And and it, there's no reason why it should be getting denied. Uh, but your app. So, my, so, my app. Yeah, yeah. So, Nick, yeah. Uh, I made the art. I got my stuff with Onify and all that. Now, where do I go if I don't have an in at Christie's? Uh, where would a normal beginner NFT artist go to display their art so they can sell it? So, yeah. So once you make something in, um, in, in my app, you would, uh, then you would go to OpenSea. I, there's links from my app into OpenSea or Rarible, whichever marketplace you like better. And then um, you would import your Ethereum address from, so this is, you know, it's not a simple process, but maybe we'll try and make it easier. But you have to import your Ethereum private key from OwnerFi into that marketplace. Um, and then once you do that, now you have the ability to sell your goods in that marketplace. So do um, people just go to that particular place to look for art? or? So both of those marketplaces, OpenSea and Rare, Rarible, have massive communities. And that's where... Um, I mean, so those ones are, are more open. Then you have ones like Nifty Gateway and um uh and mintable that are more closed sources more closed ecosystems where um they only sell the tokens that are made in those in those marketplaces so if you make on mintable then mintable is only selling mintable goods um open c is selling every nft from everywhere um so they have a bigger audience at open c so um and they have a bigger audience at rarible so you so it's probably in most people's best interest to um, to to get their private key imported into OpenSea or Rarible and then put it for sale. You can put it for sale in both at the same time if you want. Really? You can. Oh yeah. It's oh, yeah. illegal. Totally, and no one is going to stop you. The what would happen is it is the first place it was bought, it would get transferred, and then the other uh, the other sale would. Um, I'm not sure if it would collapse, but it would definitely error out if somebody tried to uh, complete the other the other purchase. So are there's only one block. Kind of like are these places kind of like galleries where people go to check out the latest art? Yeah. So that's another thing is you don't have to put it for sale. It's actually already like so everything you make in my platform is already visible. Any F, any F, F, NFT you make anywhere is already visible in OpenSea and rareable because you can just put in the contract address and the token and you can see any any nft that exists on ethereum so so if i make uh if i make an nft artwork on your platform it'll automatically show up on open c because they're always looking at the blockchain exactly it takes about eight minutes and you already get a full page display on open c of your nft so is there like nft art galleries where people just have exhibitions or is it the different kind of culture <laughs> there there are so there's people making like virtual reality nft art um galleries and stuff like that um so there, there's different ways that people sort of absorb consume these nfts for sure so nick uh there's something kind of like a gallery do i submit to a gallery do i have my own virtual gallery how do I get people to see my artwork? Yeah, so you could, uh, I mean, you could build a gallery on your website. You could um, you could get that information from, uh, there's lots of different APIs on the web that serve that information uh, that like 
grab it from the blockchain and make it publicly available. And some people are using that information to put into VR galleries. Um, really? Yeah. You can make yeah. VR art out of your NFT? Yeah. So some people have made uh, virtual reality like um, galleries you walk through and you can see the NFTs um, wow. from certain people or whatever. You can make a picture frame that shows your NFTs constantly, like in your living room. Um, you, I mean, you, there's like any way that you can imagine you could use to display your NFTs. And, and NFTs don't need to be flat. They don't necessarily need to be flat images either. They could be MP4s. Um, they can be GIFs. Um, you know, they can be, uh, some people have made object files so they can be 3D objects. So they can be animated, they can be sound, they can be video. Uh, yeah. They can be linked to any data file, right? Right. They can be linked to the, it can evolve as well over time. Um, so, you know, like, uh, I mean, you wouldn't want to change, you'd want to always bundle that original. If you're doing something like IPFS or an image hash, like I'm doing, um, you would want to always keep that image around. So you could see like, what will, Hey, what was the original art that was supposed to come with this? But you could continually add more data to the NFT if you wanted to. Is that something where people can follow you once you start your own thing in that universe, like you would on Instagram or other social media? Um, uh, you mean like follow an NFT or I don't think follow uh, an NFT artist work or like well, you just follow. Yeah, I mean, if so, you could. the The problem with the, like the NFT universe right now is that it's very disjointed. And you've got like an artist who's minting through one platform and then they jump over and they might mint through another platform and they, they might actually be putting work out on several different addresses. So then it's something maybe more like how Beeple is using Instagram and his 2 million followers and then he gets them, he leverages his Instagram followers to go and, and buy his work on the, uh, in the NFT world. Yeah, I mean, the way that a lot of it is working right now is people are just uh, accepting what they're told is the correct artwork to look at. You know, there's not a lot of verification going on. There's like, you know, he, people li links to his NFT and now it's the official NFT because it was linked to from um, from his uh, from his Instagram. Um, but, um, you know, probably moving forward, there's, should be like official addresses that these things come from. I'm sure people has been using an official address, but, um, a lot of people have not been, and, and that's probably something that's going to be more important. Do you think there'll be uh, more curators and dealers who will help other NFT artists get their work <clears throat> out and be seen? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, well, definitely there's going to be like producers, who are like people who help artists um, produce art and then they have like official addresses that are always that always release that artist's work. And uh, so it would be like a Sony of NFTs or RCA of NFTs. Um, and those those like sort of um, producers or publishers um, are, are, will help the artists and um, and that they, they'll because they're coming from those addresses, people will know they're more they're le more likely to be official. Um, because those people won't want to spoil the reputation of their publishing address. And do you, what kind of people are, what kind of person collects NFTs? That what is? Uh, I know all sorts of people probably collect them, but is there any particular distinguishing characteristics besides having a, a ton of money um, to buy art? That's definitely the main characteristic, <laughs> um, especially having a ton of money in crypto. Um, because it's a really interesting one. If you're a financial uh, investor and you're, you're make your living through finances, then it's a new asset class, and um, it's it's a different. Um, it's a d diversification. It gives you like this a new way to, to invest and spend money and 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 like um, own something. So it's an interesting way to spend money. That's for sure. Um, uh, so the, the younger, wealthy kind of tech person or crypto person, you're saying? Yeah, I mean, it's young, young tech, tech. I mean, like, like the owners of of large cryptocurrency companies, large exchanges, and things like that are buying these, uh, are bidding on these um, because it's like a prestige factor for them. Um, it's not necessarily, it isn't necessarily, um, you know, art connoisseurs. Um, 
you know, well, that, I, yet at the same time, a place like Christie's, which does have uh, art connoisseurs, they're they're getting involved now too, and I can only assume there will be more. It's actually an interesting question. Uh, two things: one, obviously, Christie's is not going to be the only legitimate auction house for fine art. It's probably going to now get into the crypto art and the NFT business. Uh, yeah. But I'm also thinking to myself, you know, David Hockney who is the highest paid living artist in the world, uh, for the last decade has been doing a series of artworks on his iPad that when you go to the museums and the galleries, they'll just have the iPad on display mm. or a monitor with the iPad that shows the work. So I'm assuming he can take his digital art and he could convert it into an NFT and that might sell for even more money than Mr. Beepsy. Oh, yeah. I mean, especially because uh, it'll translate so well because it's a one to one translation. It's not just a photo of a piece of art. It is the actual pic- hey, exact hey, Nick, art. I, I wanted to. Uh, I mean, one of my observations was that is that um, at the beginning of the crypto craze, a lot of people thought it was worthless. And there were a lot of people who thought it was going to blow up like someday. And this is like a long time ago. I mean, I was one of them. I, I mined Bitcoin using my uh, video card for a while. <laughs> and I sold, I think, 0.2 Bitcoin that I had mined like five mm. years ago for about 200 bucks. And I think that would be worth like $10,000 now. So oh, my God. <laughs> that was a huge mistake wow. on my part. Um, oh, well. Maybe more than that. But anyway. Uh, yeah, I mined it with my video card. Can you believe that, Nick? Um, anyway, so it was my observation. So I remember those early days. People were m- mining it and collecting it like crazy, not knowing what they were going to do with it. So one of my observations, I think, is that some of these buyers of NFTs are perhaps people that had uh, collected a bunch of crypto when it was cheap, and now they're trying to find ways to use it. Yeah. Think that could I be mean, the case? I think they're trying to beat the market. So, like, you have... Um... I mean, there are art connoisseurs, like, you know, like there definitely are people who are going to OpenSea and, and buying pictures that they like and NFTs that they like and trying to support artists. But those are most of those are art pieces are going for like are like ten dollars and super cheap. And the people buying them are they don't have a lot of money either. So uh, the people at the top of this whole chain are definitely people who, um, as far as I've seen, are people who already own 100 Bitcoin. And then they're like, um, if I buy one of these NFTs, is it going to beat my Bitcoin? You know, is it, 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 it let, if, if I take a little bit of risk on this, if I can if, see if I can um, beat my already appreciating uh, Bitcoin with this NFT, I, I think that has a lot to do with. Um, well, our, dri- our collection in general is for the most part, in the, certainly in this part of the history, always a financial investment. I mean, even today. <laughs> You know, paintings, uh, Damien Hirst, I'll bring them up. You know, one of the ways that Damien Hirst got to be such a an highly uh, profitable painter is he would take a piece of work, he'd price it at, say, $150 million. Then he'd find six investors to all come in with him and pony up $150 million for the work. And by doing so, all the other Damien Hirst work that these people have collected goes up in value. So yeah. basically, the these kinds of financial tricks, uh, art as something as an investment, all of what, what you've just said about crypto has pretty much been how the regular art world has been working for decades and decades. Right. It's kind I've of heard that. that the business I've heard model that. isn't that different. I've heard that. I've heard that a lot. And it seems to me like that this, if you translate what has been going on in traditional art and how it's just kind of like a place to move money around and a way for you to sort of manipulate, like, you know, how you are, how, how you, you know, how you, how it looks like you spend money or how you're taxed or who, whatever those things are. Um, if, if you look at it from that lens, I think that, it is just a hyper version of that. You can say it's a hyper version of that. It's a if more efficient, faster, stronger, better version of that. And like, you know, it's like you wanted to you wanted a way to invest in Monet's, like here's 20 Monet's, you know, like you know, it's hyper Monet's, you know. Actually, like it's a good point because there is a Monet that just sold two years ago for what was a lot of money for a Monet, which is 14 million dollars. 
Whereas yeah. right behind you and right behind me are a series of NFTs that at least one or two of them have gone for roughly the same amount of money, if not more. And no offense to the artists whose work are right behind us, but I don't think anyone would call them a Monet. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> but I do wonder, as Christie's, Sotheby's, and in general, all of the traditional established art collecting world, uh, they will want to get involved. Do you think they may come in and take away, the, not take away the platform, but become the new platform for uh, selling NFT art? Or do you think this is more of a one-off over at Christie's? Um, I don't think that those players can uh, come in and dictate those terms. I, I, I think that like the, 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 the cat is out of the box or the bag or this is this is more of an open ecosystem now and those big players are not going to dictate who um, which art pieces are worth more like you can see already um, you've got crypto punks and um, you have like these early nfts that are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and they are very anti-art world they are very much only in the nft art space and they have nothing to do with um, they have nothing to do with any famous artists or stuff. They they only have something to do with the fact that they're that they were created like sort of offhandedly at a whim of like a company that didn't know that NFTs were going to be popular. So they're not popular because of the art. They're popular because of the circumstance. And right. I just um, for the audience, I just want to say yeah. crypto punks are a series of NFT artworks uh, that were created a long time ago, right, Nick? Yeah, they were one of the early NFTs that were created, um, and they uh, have really bad artwork on them. <laughs> <laughs> well, Randall, so, uh, I, I know you've been talking about for a while before we did the show, and I really feel it, it exemplifies that the, the culture of likes <laughs> and how this relates to the popularity of crypto art, of NFT well, art. Well, I guess we're going to talk about the aesthetics of this art now. Um, right, yeah. You know, this art, it's like Nick just said, really. I mean, it's like uh, this art, it comes from the Internet. It uh, was made popular by the Internet. It'll probably maintain its popularity because of the Internet. And and uh, so a lot of it exists within social media, um, which is like uh, a social media has like an uh, economy of likes where everyone's trying to chase as many likes as possible. I mean, people, one of the reasons people... I was reading the New Yorker article that I, we're going to link to. Uh, one of the reasons people got involved in trying to sell his work as NFTs is because he had so many followers on social media as compared to uh, these other artists who were making big money on N NFTs. <laughs> so he thought, well, I have all these followers. I mean, why? Well, he had two thing? million on right. Instagram. He had way more followers than like even the top NFT artists. So he's like, well, why don't I do it? I'm going to make even more money. And he was right. So we're in this uh, we weird art world where, uh, aesthetically speaking, the art that goes to the top is going to be the art that gets the most likes. So you ask, well, what kind of art is that? I mean, you know, uh, I'll link to this article too. The, the art, the artworks behind us, uh, they're works that NFT works that have sold uh, for the most. They're the top ten. Um, they're, I mean, some of them are are. Uh, I don't know more more challenging than others, but <laughs> some of them. Yeah, I think that's the right word. It's like it's like it's like how much effort went into them. Is not it's like are they bad or good? It's like it's more like how much effort went into some of them. Well, there's effort. There's also uh, just like the intellectual aspect. Of, I mean, uh, when I say challenging, I guess I mean the intellectual aspect of it. Like for for like for instance, Banksy is like a very popular artist on the internet, and I don't think his work is very intellectually demanding. And you know. That's probably uh, why one of the reasons it's so popular. I mean, you can't make like a, a super intellectual, <clears throat> heady piece of art that'll get traction on the internet, I don't think. I mean, well, I, I we, will we're disagree talking about with you an on, art world. on Banksy. Uh, uh, I, I do think there's a certain genius to Banksy. And I, I can see with Beepsy, it reminds me of Goya, you know, back in the early 1800s with his monsters and gargantuan people. I mean, there's always been a style of art that is uh, hallucinatory and uh, makes fun of the leading uh, lights of the day, a satirical style. So that will always be around. And in that sense, I think 
It's very funny because I honestly think so much of what we're looking at today is incredibly old. I mean, when the Gutenberg printing press first came out, at night they would make these hard etchings of pornography. So there has always been this kind of folk art or even fine artists who have made subversive caricatures of leading lights of society of the day for a long time. And I, I, I think the only thing different is the tools. I know we just did an episode about the Bernie meme, the Mittens meme a few weeks back. And I feel like this is almost like a continuation on that, which is that the internet is the great democratization of art. So no longer do you need to go to a museum, no longer do you need to go to a gallery, no longer do you need to be the physical owner of a work of art, because I could get one of those digital TV screens and just throw any of these works of art behind me up and decorate my house. I can live with this art as much as anyone else. Uh, and I do really like what you've been saying, Nick and Randall, about how basically it's, it's art has always been controlled by an elite group of people, kings, the church, uh, the wealthiest merchants. But now you have a kind of art that will never be holed up in a castle or a mansion. It'll be art that can still be owned by a wealthy person and the artist can still make a ton of money as if they had a wealthy patron. But the rest of the world has equal access to the art. Yeah, you know, I wanted to say, Chris, that that's really important because you can even see with uh, Beeple's work, you know, uh, how he's improved over the years. And you can see how a lot of this work has just gotten better and better and better as time has gone on. I think the audience uh, is getting more exposure. They're getting more sophisticated. I mean, um, with this open, these open art galleries, uh, I mean, it's just gonna it's just gonna increase the average uh, consumer's uh, appreciation and taste. I think. And like any good art, it's gonna cause the establishment to be up in arms, <laughs> to say, "Who are these? Who are these savages? These barbarians who are challenging the way we used to make money, the way we used to do business." So, well, we'll see I'm what happens. But, that. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But there might not ever there might not be an establishment in art uh, one day. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Some, so, you know, what's interesting about these NFTs also is that uh, is that the, 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 the medium itself, the sort of like the tiling here that you see in the background or the way they're displayed is uh, it, it, it works better with some art than others. So some of these simplistic like, you know, like the nine cat or, um, you know, the, the more simple art, you know, pops. It's easier to understand. It's easier to understand when it's tiled. It's uh you know, it's more recognizable, it's more symbolic. So, I mean, you know, like it, it's it's possible just the format itself just lends itself better to some of the, you know, you get a really complicated oil painting or something and you can't even, you can't tell what's going on in it. And it's, you know, it's maybe it's not as good for this format necessarily. Yeah, there, there's a certain, the internet demands immediacy of its, uh, it's, a, it's an, an aesthetic of immediacy, wouldn't you say? Oh, I will definitely say that, uh, yes. <laughs> but I was just going to say that uh, we're at the nascent point. So it'll be interesting to see where things go. I, Randall, I just want to thank your mom uh, for raising two very brilliant, very uh, knowledgeable, very good conversationalist sons. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for being our first guest and uh, showing us why we should have guests on more often. Uh, we literally could not have done this show without you. Yeah, Nick. Thanks for coming being sure, on. I don't think you knew. Me. I don't think you knew you were our first guest uh, ever, did you? <laughs> Chris told me. Yeah. Okay. Chris told me. <laughs> well, I, admittedly, I could do a whole other episode just having questions about Randall, but that'll have to be for another time and in another place. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nick, for joining us. Uh, Randall, you have any sure, last pleasure. words? Oh, please come again. Uh, Randall, do you have any last words? No, I don't have any last words. Nick, do you have any last words? Did you anything you'd like to say that we didn't cover? No, no, it sounds good to me. I mean, you could go and anyone could go way in depth. This NFT world is is very deep, um, and uh, I highly recommend people get dig into it because I, I mean, the future of NFTs is going to be very wild, and I have no idea where it's going. But I think everybody should be aware of it important and again that's ownify right ownerify ownerify 
OwnerFi. Excellent. Everybody yeah, can, check that out. You can Owner go to OwnerFi.com. OwnerFi.com. All right. Until next time, uh, I'm Chris. I'm Randall. That's Nick. I'm Randall. Thanks brother. for listening. <laughs> Bye. Right. Bye. Bye.